So we're going to finish up our tour of plant families with the asterid group. And so that's going to be this remaining lineage of plants down here in this phylogenetic tree. And that doesn't look like much given that we've gone through all of these other things. But remember, there's not really that many ferns or cycads or ginkgos or pines, etc. So every time there's a tip of this tree doesn't necessarily mean uh, any indication of how many species are there. If we look just at this group called the asterids, this is one third of all angiosperm species are included down here. So there's a huge amount of diversity left over for us to talk about. All members of the asterids have fused petals. And typically the number of stamen equals the number of petals. So that can be one of the traits that holds this whole group together. There's a couple notable groups here that we're going to briefly mention. The Apocynaceae includes things like milkweeds and stuff like that. We're not going to talk about those here. We're just going to focus on the Rubiaceae. Members of the Rubiaceae are relatively diverse. In fact, in the world, they're one of your um, top five species. There's 9,000 Rubiaceae in the world, but most of the diversity of those guys is in the tropics and not so much in North America. In the U.S., there's about 317 species. In Alabama, we just have 42. South America in the tropics of Central and South America is where most of the diversity is, the centers of diversity throughout the world. So these plants tend to be whorled or have opposite leaves. So one of our local examples is gallium or bed straw and it has whorled leaves. Uh, one of the things that a lot of these plants have in common is that they've got four petals to the flowers. So four petals for bluet, four petals for bed straw. Often these plants are glanded, so they have glandular trichomes. They usually have very prominent stipules or stipule scars. So there's some pretty useful plants in this group. Coffee, for example, one of the most important agricultural crops in the world in terms of money. Um, but also the fever bark tree, uh, which produces the compound quinine, which I've referenced earlier on as a medicinal um, plant product that protects people from malaria, and derivatives of which may possibly be helpful against COVID-19, the virus that carries that uh, causes COVID-19. Now one of the things that I say in the notes there is that the fruits are never beans. We often refer to the beans of coffee, but they're not actually beans. Instead, the fruits of members of the Rubiaceae might be capsules, they might be droops, or in the case of coffee, berries. So actually we've got coffee berries, and these are just the seeds inside of the berries. The next uh, lineage that we're going to talk about is the order the Lamiales. The Lamiales incur includes a whole bunch of things, including uh, olives and uh, these invasive olive relatives like Chinese privet, uh, but we're going to jump down to just the Lamiaceae. Bignoniaceae great group. We've got a few of those in our collections um, of videos. Plantagenaceae, a few people have found some Plantago species, but we're going to stick with just Lamiaceae, a much more diverse group. So the Lamiaceae, this is the mint family. There's a good number of those throughout the world too, 6,900, almost 7,000 species. In the U.S., 550. Alabama, about 60 species. So up there. Uh, the center of diversity, so where is the most species of these throughout the world, is in the Mediterranean region. And that sort of makes sense when you think about what some of the plants are that belong to the Lamiaceae. These guys can include herbs, shrubs, and some trees. So there are trees and shrubs that are in the mint family. Um, again, they have fused petals. In this case, though, they have five lobes. lobes. And uh, when you look up close at the flower head of Monarda, wild bergamot, um, it's a pretty complex inflorescence. But each one of them, uh, each, each of these inflorescences is made up of multiples of these separate flowers that have fused petals. Now, these guys all have opposite leaves, and they all have square stems. 
members of the Rubiaceae, uh, the last family that we talked about, also typically have square stems, but uh, you usually won't confuse members of the Lamiaceae with members of the Rubiaceae, largely because of the differences in the flowers. Also, members of the Lamiaceae tend to be much, much more aromatic than members of the Rubiaceae. Now, they're closely related, so they share a lot of traits for that reason, but there's a lot of things that help distinguish them. A lot of the plants in this family are used for condiments and perfumes. So, for example, mint and a lot of mint rel relatives, oregano, patchouli, rosemary, sage, thyme, basil, lavender, a lot of edible plants in this group. And if you think about, for example, basil, if you've seen fresh basil or you smell it, you just touch the plant and it's very, very aromatic. This happens a lot of times because they have trichomes, uh, like members of the Rubiaceae, like another family that we'll talk about, the Solanaceae, in a little bit. So there are, uh, again, some traits that are shared in common here with this family and their close relatives. Now there is one plant in this family that is has some particular um, uh, hallucinogenic properties. This is a plant known as Salvia divinorum. This is uh, one that is native to Mexico. Again, it's a member of the mint family, so it's got a lot of those similar traits, opposite, square stems, etc. Uh, same genus as sage, the herb that is often used for cooking, especially cooking meats. And we'll talk about this plant a little bit more when we get to medicinal and hallucinogenic plants. The next lineage that we'll talk about, uh, again, in this asteroid one group, so I've been talking about things that they all share in common, um, is the Solanaceae. Solanaceae is a very, not, not particularly huge group, but a very important group nonetheless. The diversity here is largely in Central and South America again, so these are a lot of New World families, um, largely in, in the tropics of Central and South America. The fruit of these things is a berry with many seeds, so be thinking about things like tomatoes. This is a wild plant, a, a weed called horse nettle, but this looks identical to tomato flowers. Tomato flowers look a lot like this. There's a lots of other uh, edible plants that are in this group, um, including potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, Tobacco is also in this family, so lots of useful plants. There are a few drug plants, too, or plants that we get some drugs from, which I'll talk about in a second. So, not again, not a huge family, around 2,900 species in the world, 200 in the U.S., and about 48 in Alabama. So we've got a pretty good number of them. They're relatively diverse for here. And many of these have glandular trichomes, so these are those little... Uh, trichomes that will have glands associated with them where they release these chemicals through the trichomes. And that turns out to be an important thing for members of the Solanaceae. Many of the members of the Solanaceae contain alkaloid compounds that are easily absorbed through the skin. When they're on the surface of these trichomes and they're easily absorbed through the skin, you can apply them to areas of your body that um, have a lot of vascularization close to the surface of the skin. So in the case of witches, there is one story that suggests the reason why uh, witches were mostly female and were associated with broomsticks is because they would take atropine, uh, an alkaloid derived from uh, a member of the Solanaceae, and apply it to broomsticks and then rub it on female parts that had a lot of vascularization in the tissue and that led to hallucinations and then that led them to thinking that they could affiliate with the devil or perform magic. That's one story anyway. Other members of the Solanaceae have been involved in some other interesting lore like the creation of zombies. Now there's a lot of zombies in uh, TV these days. This is a clip or a little image of an old zombie movie but uh, in the upper right hand corner here we have a drawing of an individual in Haiti who has made zombies. Now zombies are a real thing. There are very few people who have made zombies and they don't exactly go out to advertise themselves, but how these plants have been used 
is they have compounds that produce a very sedated state. They uh, cause someone to basically go to sleep uh, so in such a deep way that it's hard to separate them from being dead. The zombie cucumber is a member of the Solanaceae that's involved in this concoction that the boker, um, the person who makes the zombie, um, uses along with poisons from puffer fish and other things like that. So these alkaloids, which are easily absorbed through the skin, gets applied to a piece of a plant that the person who's going to make a zombie hits somebody in the arm with and then the next thing you know those drugs have been uh, brought into the body they've been metabolized and the person falls asleep as though they are dead then they ha the boker has the ability to revive them again and um, have some control over them so the idea is that they can raise people from the dead so there are such things as um, zombies and they're used in certain forms of ritual practice for voodoo and a plant is involved. Now we're going to get to the last group here. We're going to skip a whole bunch of other plants in, or in a bunch of other orders in the asterid 2 group. There's a lot of things that are very important here as well but we're going to skip right down to the asteraceae which will actually be our final family that we cover. And we're going to end on a high note. In the world, there's 23,000 approximately species of Asteraceae, which is quite a lot. In the U.S., there's 2,700. In Alabama, there's 487. I'll get to the diversity of plants in your top 10 list in just a little bit, and we'll recap that since we're finishing here. But suffice it to say that there's more Asteraceae than anything else except for orchids. They're a highly, highly diverse group, highly successful group. The one distinctive feature that they have is something that we've already talked about in class, which is their inflorescences. Their inflorescence is a head made up of hundreds, oftentimes, of flowers all compacted together into a very small space, represented by something like uh, the fleabane, which a lot of people have seen, um, also cone flowers, and coreopsis. These plants are everywhere throughout the world. They're highly diverse all over the place. One other feature that's associated with the capitulate head of the inflorescence of these plants is this structure known as the involucre, which we talked about back when we talked about different kinds of flowers before. But here is another sort of reminder that this part of the flower is made up of a whole bunch of inflorescence. Or this part of the inflorescence is made up of a whole bunch of flowers, and these are bracts that are the involucre is a bunch of bracts that come underneath the inflorescence. The fruits or seeds of these plants are pretty much always achenes, so think of sunflower seeds. And there are a lot of useful plants in this group. Artichokes, sunflowers, sunflower seeds, um, lettuce, so lettuce is in this family. A pretty important plant, but you know we would survive without it. Um, also cooking oil, sunflower oil, um, a couple other kinds of oils also come from members of this family, seeds of this family. So pretty useful, um, but again, not as much as you would imagine for how diverse this plant is. Most of the North American Asteraceae that we're familiar with are all herbaceous, but there are plants that are woody plants that are in this family. And again, the characteristic feature of these inflorescences is that there will be a head, a collection of a whole bunch of flowers all in one spot, and that there will be two different kinds of flowers. There will be disc or ray flowers, in most members anyway. Sometimes the disc flowers are all that is there and there aren't any ray flowers. Sometimes there are mostly ray flowers, but there will usually be at least some disc flowers. So what I've done here is I've entered a lot of the most species-rich families that we've talked about, not all of them, uh, but most of them, and I've sorted them in this particular view by the number of species that each family has in the world. And I've highlighted here the top five species, most speciose plant families in the world. And you can see that number one is the Orchidaceae, number two is the Asteraceae, number three is Fabaceae, 
PoACE is 4 and Ruby ACE in the world is number 5. In columns C and D, I've highlighted the species, the families with the most species in the U.S. and in Alabama, and you can see that those line up pretty well. So your top one in the United States is the Asteraceae, two is Fabaceae, three is Poaceae, and then let's not forget Cyperaceae. I misspoke earlier on when I was talking about uh, which family was. Um, the fourth one or the third fourth one in the US and Cyperaceae is up there very high and then Roseaceae is going to be number five for you. Same goes and uh, more or less same order but a slight switching in Alabama number one is Asteraceae, number two is Poaceae, number three in Alabama is the Cyperaceae so grasses and sedges are two and three, and then we get to Fabaceae and then Rosaceae. So those are the families to kind of keep track of in terms of having loads and loads and loads of species.